our biggest storage event just got stronger. The Store More Save More event going on now at the Home Depot. Get the exclusive 77-inch Husky welded I-beam steel shelving for just $179. It now holds up to 10,000 pounds. Plus, it's the only steel shelving with a full lifetime warranty. Find more Husky steel shelving online at homedepot.com. The Home Depot, how doers get more done. Limited time only. Event and dates vary by store. Claim based on 2,500 pounds per shelf when evenly distributed. See store for details. Hey, hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to a awesome episode of Geek Vibes Live Review. Um, I'm your host, Tia, and I have with me a very special guest. I have Michael Cook from Thoroughly Modern Reviewer. How are you today, Michael? I'm good. How are you, Tia? I'm great. Um, so backstory for anyone. I, uh, if you've listened to any of my podcasts on Geek Fives Nation, you know that I am a huge American Gods fan. And I have ran into Michael on Twitter threads before under American Gods. And I figured, you know what? We're both geeky about this. Why not just get together one day and talk about it? But um I wanted to ask really quick before we dove any further into it. Were you into, did you get him into American Gods say before season one? Like, did you watch it from the start or did you start afterwards? Like, where were you at that? Yeah. So I read the book in like 2013 or 2014. And around that time, they were talking about making an HBO adaptation of it. Mm-hmm. And it never went anywhere. And Hannibal was on the air at the time with Brian Fuller making that show. And then somewhere in there, they announced they were moving it to stars and he was going to be developing it. So I have been on the American Gods train since then. (laughs) For me, um, so little quick, quirky note about myself. If I discover an actor who I think is really talented, I suddenly just want to watch everything that they're in. And this happened with Pablo Schreiber. I had, of course, watched uh, Orange is the New Black, but then I had watched this Netflix movie called Thumper. Um, I saw him in a few episodes of Law and Order SVU, and I was like, you know, Pablo Schreiber is really talented. He's not just porn stash from Orange is the New Black. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so then I looked at his filmography because I wanted to see uh, something that he was in that, say, he was in it substantially, not, say, just five minutes here, five minutes there. Mm-hmm. And I saw, oh, okay, he's been in a eight-episode season called American Gods. All right, I'll check it out. And at first, I remember I was telling uh, my good friend, Brittany, who I do the top 10 with every week, I was saying, you know, the show's a little weird, but Pablo Schreiber's really good in it. He plays a tall leprechaun. That's ironic. You know, haha. And I think in the middle of the season, I just got so into it where I was like, I'm not just watching this anymore for Matt Sweeney. I'm watching it just because... I think it's really, really good. And then I rewatched it and rewatched it, and I just decided to dedicate my time to American Gods. And I started listening to the Audible version of the book, and I, you know, it. I loved it. I thought it was funky. I thought it was unique. It was a premise that I had never really seen before, and I was surprised to hear all of the like drama in the background and. So for you, you're saying that uh, you had read the book, obviously, and you were into Hannibal, Brian Fuller. But was there ever a moment for you when it was announced that Brian Fuller was stepping away from the show that you felt like you didn't want to watch it anymore? I don't know if I if I felt like I wanted to give up on the show, but I was really nervous about what they do without Brian and Michael because – it's, that first season just felt so informed by the two of them and their styles that it. I was concerned, especially when they announced that um, Jesse Alexander was going to be replacing them. And he'd worked on Hannibal with Brian. So I was concerned they were essentially getting like Brian Fuller light where right. they wouldn't have to work with him, but they could still have his sensibility. And so I was just kind of concerned, I guess, is the word I would use. Yeah, I think for me, um, you see, I really like season two, right? And well, I so saw, do I. I think it worked out really well. 
and I think that we're on the same page that I had just seen people who I think couldn't let go that Brian Fuller and Michael Green weren't attached to it anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it was a little concerning when you heard Jesse Alexander had stepped away. I think in my mind, I was like, all right, what's going on with American Gods that all these people are stepping away? But again, I really enjoy it. So season one felt, I think, maybe the closest to the book. Do you feel the same way with that? At at times I do, and at times I don't. And it's kind of ironic that you say that, because one of the reasons that got reported as to why Brian Fuller and Michael Green departed was that Neil Gaiman thought they were going too far off the book. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how true that is. It was something that got put into one of the trades back in when all that was going on. But, like, it started off really faithful, and then they started, like, cannibalizing things from later in the book and moving them earlier. Oh, yeah. gosh, I forgot to silence my phone. Oh, it's perfectly... Don't you, I, I love, actually, that. That's from Kim Possible, right? <laughs> yeah, my ringtone is Kim Possible. <laughs> That's great. Uh, with all the shitty uh, f- options on your phone, at least you have something interesting. <laughs> I think I ended up putting it on there. It was a whole thing. But, um... <laughs> so, like, they, they moved Easter from the lakeside portion of the novel up to the season one finale, and, and that was something... It was a pattern they continued in season two where they were moving bits and pieces around, which tracks with the way that Brian Fuller was approaching the Hannibal mythology by like using parts of the third book in the series, but repurposing it as part of the prequel story they were telling in the show. And so I think it was really faithful in spirit, if not necessarily strictly faithful in actual events, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was surprised when I had listened to the Audible version of the book to see where they placed Easter. Because for someone who, when I watched season one, had nothing, had no idea of what happened in the book. Uh, to me, I was like, oh, I'm just here for the ride. But I, I thought it was interesting. I kind of thought it worked. Um, I thought it was good. I, so far, have liked the little nuances and the little changes to me i think um like for me the best changes are giving more of a uh, platform if you will or screen time i guess i should say to characters who really had nothing in the book i mean bill Quist is such a massive part of the show uh technical boy is so different and i mean bruce all right i'll ask you after i say this but not only is Matt Sweeney one of my favorite characters, but I have to say that Technical Boy wormed his little way into my heart because in the first season, I thought he was a little shithead. And then the second season, I sat there going, I really love this character, even though he's still a shithead. Um, which character do you feel like you have just latched onto the most in this show? Oh, I also really like Technical Boy. I always like the new gods, partially just because I'm a nerd and I love a lot of the <laughs> stuff they're representing. I was really attached to Gillian Anderson's media in the first season because particularly when she was David Bowie and it was just such a like this weird like crossroads of various interests for me. And that was a delight. And then I really liked what they were doing with new media in the second season. Like the idea of taking media who in the book felt fairly relevant in 2001, but in like 2019, when everybody's focused on social media, it felt really interesting to explore that idea. So I ended up latching on to that particular character as well. I will say I, I really did like, Jillian Anderson's media I wish that she had stuck around just because I liked more of the idea of say media and Mr. World being more of parents to Technical Boy yeah than that any- was a fun element that was a fun element for me in season one my favorite episode is Lemon Scented You and Same. Uh, best uh, episode yeah. <laughs> best episode and particularly because i just love that scene when wednesday and shadow are in the police station Mm -hmm. and media world go and try and pretty much offer an olive branch and then 
world is saying, all right, where is Technical Boy? He needs to come apologize to Shadow. And I just love it where he goes to media and he goes, is he still sulking <laughs> to me? It was just like, I loved that dynamic and I would have loved to see it in season two. I understand that uh, Jillian Anderson and, oh God, I always forget her name, the actress who played Easter. but uh, Kristen Chenoweth. Yes, thank you. I believe they both left because of Brian Ful- uh, uh, Fuller leaving. Yeah, they both worked with him on various shows in the past, and I suspect left out of a loyalty. Although yeah. they both ended up being busy with other projects as well. I think X-Files was filming somewhere in there. You could be right. Um, I don't think that I ever looked too deep in it because I kind of, I thought in the second season they did a pretty good job in just explaining why those two actresses weren't there. I mean, Mr. Nancy says, uh, you know, Easter got offended that Wednesday ran over her rabbits and with media, media is always, uh, you know, changing and evolving. So I understood that. Um, Yeah. I will say, however, I wasn't, say, the biggest fan of new media, only because I then did feel like uh, Technical Boy became a little redundant. Yeah, and I it's... was thinking about that today as well, how uh, it seemed like the two of them were the same god at times, and so they were almost canceling each other out. Like, where where does the line between Technical Boy and new media end exactly uh for me media seemed more of the big picture of broadcast and fake news and things like that whereas uh new media is tiktok and instagram and it's like well isn't technically that all done on technical boys platform yeah yeah so i i felt that way um and it was no disrespect to the actress Kaiyun Kim um it seemed like they had a really great time behind the scenes it's just as far as storyline goes i didn't particularly like it and it seemed as if they i, I don't know if it was uh, i'm guessing it's the new showrunner's decision where maybe he saw that he didn't want to have that sort of redundancy um so you know we have that but you know i feel as if I want to, I was going to ask a little later, but I feel like we should kind of rip off the bandaid and kind of talk about this. So Mm -hmm. um, obviously we just mentioned how American gods has had its fair share of drama behind the scenes, but it always has seemed as if the cast at least bands together and they really want to create this really great show and this really great story. And we talk about, some of our favorite characters and certainly mr nancy was under that category of favorite characters i mean just he stood out so much and in a good way and so last year when orlando jones comes out and says that he was fired i was so shocked um what were your thoughts when that announcement was made i i had heard some rumblings on reddit about a month or two before um orlando jones came out and made a statement that neither um mr nancy or the Jin were going to be returning but i had just dismissed them as people speculating based on nothing and so when he came out and made that video i was not as surprised as i could have been because i had already kind of heard rumblings but i was i was unhappy about it i guess would be the word and I didn't like the way it sounded like he'd been treated. Right. Because the thing with um, Musa Kresh, and I apologize if I'm saying that name incorrectly. I'm actually really terrible with names. But the actor who played the Jinn, I think that that was at least a little nicer because he still... um, you know, retweets American God stuff. He still kind of talks about it. Him and Omid go back and forth every once in a while. So I think that him not returning was maybe more of a gentler process. Maybe they told him like, hey, uh, we don't need you this season. Maybe we'll bring you back if there's a fourth season, things like that. But um, Orlando Jones from his video made it seem as if this was a hard uh, firing and I and this is no plug at all, but I actually interviewed him like 
a week or so after he announced it. And I mean, he made it seem as if this was him like legitimately getting fired for reasons that really just seemed ridiculous. First of all, saying things like his character was too angry. First of all, that's the point of his character, right? And then also, I don't know how they're supposed to do the book because you've read the book, I've mm-hmm. read the book. Mr. Nancy is quite a like prominent figure in the book. Especially so it, towards the end. Especially towards the I was saying that to my friend who hasn't read the book, but she doesn't mind me giving her, you know, tidbits of information from it. I said to her, I go, okay, maybe right now they don't need it, Mr. Nancy, because apparently that was the showrunner and the network's uh that reasoning. was their official statement, yeah. That was their official statement. I go, Okay, fine, that's all well and good. Maybe maybe that's the case, right? But you're going to need Mr. Nancy. And from what it sounds like, Orlando Jones is not keen to returning, even if they ask for him back. So how are you supposed to do that? Yeah, you know? I'm just, I'm really nervous. They're going to pull a stunt and like recast the role, which I do not think is going to go over well at all. I don't think it's going to go over well. And I don't think that you can get someone to portray that character as well as, uh, no, he's, as he's a- made it his own to the point that people are wanting them to adapt, uh, the other book that Neil Gaiman wrote in this universe, Anansi boys and have Orlando Jones reprise the role in that storyline in a yeah, completely and- different show. So I don't even know that you could cast anyone else, even if you wanted to, because, Orlando Jones is Mr. Nancy. He really is. I mean, so much so that he wrote a lot of his lines in the second season. The uh, speech in the funeral home to mm-hmm. Ebus and Bilquis, he wrote that speech. Um, I had asked him if he was still, you know, if they did say adapt and Nancy boys, if he would be interested in reprising his role. And he said that he would still like to work with Neil Gaiman, but that character, at least in that work is different than the Mr. Nancy and American gods. It would just be such a, yeah. it's such a shame. It's such a waste of casting to me because, uh-huh. Oh God, you need the show is just so disappointing. But I mean, when you heard about that, has that, changed your excitement for the show at all um in certain ways yes and in certain ways no like i have always kind of been able to separate behind the scenes drama from what i like about what i see on screen um so i've still been really excited to see where the remaining storylines are going but i'm also you know the experiences that orlando jones reports you know having had to sort of color my opinion on certain people who may be involved in making decisions behind the scenes shall we say yeah (laughs) and not to say anybody specifically it just seems like the production company might not have the best handle on what's going on well yeah and um i believe this is a I believe that American Gods, while on stars, also is produced by Fremantle. Yeah, they're not having the greatest track record at the moment. I was going to say, I think that they're the same organization that Gabrielle Union had Mm -hmm. some issues with. So, and it's just like, and this is my thing, right? Uh, If I can say this on air, like I'm, (laughs) I'm white, right? And yeah, I I am as well. So I'm, I'm trying to be, I don't want to put my foot where it doesn't belong (laughs) well not even that it's like for me it's you know how could i say say what's too angry and what's not too angry right yeah that's like what i'm saying yeah and and then i also think then how can the new showrunner say that as well um it's it to me it's like orlando jones is coming from his own experience and he's putting that into the character and people really were receptive to that especially people who felt the same way that he was feeling i mean when season two was coming out i saw people really just gravitate to his speeches and so it was just disappointing and i will say that when that happened it did cut not that 
I still love the first two seasons and I still was excited, but it almost made me where I'm like, Oh God, can I even like voice my excitement? But I will say I loved the trailer for season three. I love what I've seen so far of season three. Um, And it seems as if like Lakeside is so a beloved part of the book. Would you Mm -hmm. say that when you read the book, that's also a part of the book that you really look forward to? Yeah. It's, it's the part of the book where it seems like certain elements that have not been connecting in the earlier parts start to uh, come together in a way where you start to kind of figure out what's going on as well as the twin peaks element of like the weird, creepy town where all of these where everything seems really happy on the surface, but there's this darkness underneath. And I always find that really compelling in stories. So it's one of my favorite parts, and it's the thing that I think a lot of people have been waiting for the show to get to. I believe so as well. Um, When I heard that season three was going to be Lakeside, I saw so many people excited. And so we're coming into this new season. There's a lot new going on, right? But I wanted to talk going into season three, right? We have where season two ended off where, and I know I'm all over the place, by the way. <laughs> I, I told Michael before this, I'm like, this is just my style. I just like going places. I hate feeling like wooden where I'm like, I have to get to this question and this question. Um, but we go into season three and in season two, Shadow finds out that Wednesday is his dad. Um, which is something that didn't happen till much later in the book, but I kind of like it. I, I like that Shadow knows now instead of not knowing. Yeah, I um, before I get to that, I, I want to say one more thing about the Orlando Jones stuff, Absolutely, yeah. which is that in light, <laughs> in light of um, all of like, like you just said, there's a bunch of new stuff being introduced this season. So I don't I don't buy that excuse of. He's not in this part of the book because Bill Quist isn't in this part of the book. Technical Boy's not in this part of the book. None of these new characters who aren't in the lakeside portion are in the book. Like the Orishas aren't in the book. Oh, I, I yeah. think I, mean, I think if you wanted to keep Mr. Nancy, you could have found a way to keep Mr. Nancy. And so mm-hmm. I don't know that I personally buy into that particular excuse, but – no, I think it's an absolute BS part of the excuse because, yeah. uh, you know, Salim. Um, He's not in the book at this point. <laughs> yeah, d- not in the book at this point. Clearly, Laura Moon is going to have a much bigger role. I believe that Laura Moon is in the book at this point, but not to the extent that he just like, girl- pops in and out of the book the whole time. So, yeah. so you have that, uh, as you said, the Orishas aren't there um in the book we only see one mr world now we have variations of world Which so i'm really excited about danny <laughs> trejo as mr world is such a piece of just genius casting <laughs> i oh 100 percent. like we'll definitely get there uh because i have questions about that as well but yeah and it's like that's the thing is that i don't mind ever where they're going with the storyline or anything like that i will say okay let me say one thing. Mm-hmm. The one thing that I was bummed about besides the Mr. Nancy thing was I know that in the book, Matt Sweeney has such a minor role in it, but they gave him such a bigger role in the actual show that I really was hoping he'd survive. <laughs> I was really hoping they wouldn't kill him off. <laughs> yeah, I I. I don't think I connected to Mad Sweeney the way that a lot of people did in the show. Like, don't get me wrong. I thought his storyline with Laura was an absolute delight to follow. But I I can't say that I was super, super heartbroken when he died. Partially because I think I just knew it was coming. I mean, and, I mean, And I was ready to go on with the story because season two felt so often... As much as I liked it, that it was sort of like treading water at times. Yeah. And so I was ready to move forward. But I will miss him, I think. I mean, I think I would just miss his connection with Laura because it's it's made so apparent in the show that uh, Laura has accepted that 
they're never getting back together. Shadow has completely cut emotional ties with Laura. So it's kind of like, uh, and she, you know, she needs someone like Matt Sweeney. You know, Matt Sweeney was really crass. He was, you know, a bit of a bull in a china shop. And Laura could be her real self to he Matt. He kind Sweeney. of met her where she was. Exactly. But with Shadow, um, she really tried to put on a front. She yeah. really tried to be the person that she thought someone like Shadow Moon would want to be with. And it's like, that never works out. <laughs> that never is going to be successful at all. So I think that's really what it is. But um, we do see that from the trailers and some of the tidbits and everything that we're getting a new leprechaun, which again is another character that never existed in the book. Um, uh, but I kind of, first of all, let me say, I love Ewan Rion, as I said, terrible with names, but I just love him because he played the greatest villain ever on game of thrones so as soon as they announced that he was in it i was like oh i'm so excited but it's almost like they're replacing him like mad sweeney like oh look uh here's a leprechaun now he's dead but let's give laura a new leprechaun what do you think about that that was the exact vibe i got as well which was I was like, oh, we have Mad Sweeney, but, like, discount Mad Sweeney? <laughs> and, like, I, I've never seen the actor in anything before, so that that is not a comment on his performance or anything. I never watched Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. And so I am completely unfamiliar with him in general. But I, I think the more they've been revealing, the the more it seems like, oh, he's not just that but it's still a sort of weird that you introduce a new leprechaun when you just got rid of the old leprechaun it definitely is weird um like at first... one point i thought he was just going to be like an actual just new incarnation of mad sweeney which i mean listen we don't know we no, i'm not sure that's probably not the case but um Game of Thrones is really good, by the way. I, I know that the la last season wasn't the best, and you've probably seen on social media how people absolutely hated the yeah. last season. But I still think that the first seven seasons are probably the best television. And so the guy who's playing Liam played this really vicious sort of villain for a couple of seasons where it's almost weird seeing him in this character that's so nice and in that clip he goes oh i won't be party to violence and i'm like well you were only doing violence in game of thrones but like, so, don't lie to me sir i uh, know what you're up to there's a part of me that kind of thinks like all right no i don't believe this you don't get him to play this nicety nice character but it is a little weird as you said kind of a discount mad sweeney and that his thing is that wednesday destroyed his lucky coin like why was that what, what got revealed i think i missed that one uh, so in the, you know how on American Gods Twitter account, they've been doing little clips here and there. Oh, where was it in that one for him? Yeah. So when they did his clip, he says, uh, you know, he talks about Wednesday destroying his lucky coin. And I sit there and go, well, what did Liam do so badly that Wednesday would want to destroy his lucky coin? I don't know. Wednesday's just a bit of a dick. I can see it. <laughs> that is very true i He'd mean probably do it just because yeah yeah I, it's a wonder why people actually follow wednesday because he's a dick to everyone everyone <laughs> i always wanted to know what um speaking about matt sweeney i always wanted to know what uh why matt sweeney felt so desperate to not desperate like god what am i thinking of here what's the word uh where wednesday had a hold on him and what that was all about, because it was never clear in season two why, because it so was obvious that Matt Sweeney didn't want anything to do with Wednesday. Yeah, it's something that's not clear in the book either, if memory serves. Yeah, I don't think it was ever really revealed or anything at all. So I guess we're just sitting there wondering. I'm hoping. Yeah. Like they get... kept hinting that Wednesday promised him a battle, but. That seemed kind of loose to me. Yeah, I, like, I was like, I don't really know what that means, Sweeney. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, you want to die in battle, I guess. But uh, at some point, I mean, you sh if 
what Wednesday is asking you to do literally makes you sick, then why are you still doing it? it clearly, he didn't like killing Laura Moon. Yeah. It was very obvious in the first season that he didn't like having to do that. So I don't know. I'm hoping there's going to be a little bit more clarity with Liam and why Wednesday destroyed his coin, what Liam did to get him so angry at him. Mm-hmm. Um, but speaking about, say, discounts, <laughs> I so and this is no disrespect like when i talk about this if anyone's listening when i talk about this this is no disrespect to any of the actors at all um but we have the character cordelia come in and Mm -hmm. who didn't exist in the book i keep saying that now because now with the whole orlando jones thing it's like uh, your argument is so null and void but we have Cordelia who's coming in and her little snippet was she saying, oh, we're going to what I am is the human's perspective into this world of gods. And I drive Wednesday around and I do this and I do that. And I go, that sounds exactly what Shadow did in the first two seasons. Yeah, it's just Shadow, but not Shadow. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't understand what the show and the new showrunner is doing where they're essentially replacing these characters who are still in the show yeah well not matt sweeney but you know he was in the lore of the show but i mean his presence seems like it's going to be felt even without him literally being there oh yeah oh yeah and and i'm not trying to spoil anything because um you know michael and i actually were given access (laughs) to some season three but i will say that nothing that we say has any we are not revealing anything yeah we are being extremely yeah. careful here very cautious <laughs> anything i'm saying is stuff that you have seen from the trailers <laughs> i'm very good with that i remember la did you say you had gotten screeners last year yeah i had but i all of my reviews tended to go up after the episode had gone up so i was just spoiling away <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I remember last year when the screeners went up, there was one or two people who had put the episodes online. You could tell because oh, they're. Oh, yeah, the, the big leak different. that happened. The big leak, and it caused stars to take down all of the episodes from the screeners. And I sat there, I'm like, you mother effers. I was watching this and keeping my I mouth. Was, I was so lucky that I had watched the three episodes before they had like revoked all the access to them. <laughs> You know what they were doing, and I'm one. I'm hoping they do it this time. But they were actually putting the uh, next episode up before it came out on Stars. Yeah. But then stopped doing that once that whole leak happened, and I I was just so mad at that point. But uh, so we're being very careful here. But yeah, yeah the whole thing with Cordelia, and again, I don't. Ne- this is the thing. I'm a little torn at this, right? I don't particularly mind just because uh, she seems like a fun character, but yeah. her whole thing is that she teach it. And again, this is revealed in the trailers and the snippets. Um, she's helping Wednesday with tech technical stuff. And I thought Wednesday's whole thing is that he doesn't want a cell phone. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just a little bit confused about the Cordelia character on the one hand, because they moved the big shadow is Wednesday's son reveal ahead of what happens in the book they had to do something because naturally shadow is not going to want to associate with wednesday for a bit but there is stuff that wednesday has to do in the narrative where he's going to need a shadow like person and so i think they had to fill the role with someone but they didn't have anyone who would naturally fit that role that was already in the cast i mean i because, like, Salim doesn't like Wednesday at all, so you can't use Salim in that role. So you yeah. have to, I guess, make someone new. But, and I guess the argument is, like, maybe Wednesday has to embrace some of the technical stuff and that she's forcing him to. As a professional painter, you know your customers want a flat finish, but don't want to pay the price of fighting dirt, grime, and scuffs. Use new Bear Ultra Scuff Defense from The Home Depot for a beautiful flat finish, plus stain and scuff defense. And that price starts at just $29.60 a gallon. And that's before the Pro Extra discount. A flat paint that's too tough to scuff. Bare Ultra Scuff Defense, only at The Home Depot. How doers get more done. Available online and in select stores. Who are you texting? My therapist. You text with your therapist? Text, video chat, call, yep. 
That sounds too easy. How did you find her? I just went to betterhelp.com slash save. She's a licensed therapist and it's all online. I connect when it's convenient for me and don't waste time driving anywhere. Plus, it's affordable. I wonder if I should try it. It's great to talk to someone in confidence. She's helped me sort out quite a few things. And right now you save 10% off the first month when you go through betterhelp.com slash save. Betterhelp.com slash save. Got it. I don't, I don't exactly know what the intention is with that, but I also had a very like confused reaction when that got revealed in the trailers it was like who who are you <laughs> i felt the same way when american gods was announcing new characters and they're saying oh um i believe her name is ashley reyes yeah. and they're saying ashley reyes as cordelia and i'm like who is cordelia I, I i mean i only read the book once but i never heard of cordelia in it so that was my reaction to so many of the casting announcements i would they'd be revealed on twitter and i would text a friend and be like i don't know who marilyn manson's playing he's not in the book i don't know what's going on in the show i'm intrigued but i have no idea what's happening anymore it, that's the same thing like as you said there are certain things in the book that are going to happen where you need a shadow like person um in the book you, well in the show you're going to need eventually an easter like person which is where uh dement- well, is that where i didn't even make that connection <laughs> yeah well <laughs> So, well, so it's funny. I didn't really either. But as soon as that happened, I texted Brittany and I said, oh, they're they casted uh, this woman and she's going to play this character, Demeter and uh, Demeter. Again, terrible with pronunciations. But my friend Brittany was like, oh, my God, in Greek mythology, that's the mother of Persephone. And she explained who that go- goddess was. And I said to myself, that makes sense. Her, she's pretty much a Greek version of what, you know, Astara was. Yeah. So you're going to need that type of character instead of replacing Easter. We're still going to live with the uh, idea that Easter still pissed at Wednesday. And now we're just mm-hmm. going to instead have a different version of her. I actually like that it, rather than recasting Easter. I kind of like the idea of bringing in similar gods from different pantheons who can fill the same roles if you have lost an actor it makes sense because uh pretty much every single mythology that had multiple gods has a god that fills the same role that mythology does so you can do that um i'm wondering if at some point they may do something like that with mr nancy i doubt that we're going to see that in this season we'll just have to wait till you know hopefully there's a fourth season for that but um you had said, by the way, you mentioned briefly before, and I wanted to get back to it, how excited you were about Danny Trejo being uh, cast as Mr. World. And I will say that I was when it was first announced, I had a little moment where I was like, yes, excited, but oh my God, does that mean Crispin Glover isn't coming back? And it's like, no, we're going to have multiple versions of World. And I was like, that's really cool, actually. Danny Trejo's is a Danny Trejo is a great guy uh, who doesn't like seeing him in things. And I've never watched Pose with Dominique Jackson, so I don't know too much about her. I watched this little documentary thing about her and it got me more excited for her to come as Miss World. So I think that's a cool thing that they're doing, uh, kind of spreading out World that way. Yeah, I agree. It's because they, they kind of toyed with it a little bit in – that that big scene we both love in season one where he – during um, episode five when World is like touching his face and it keeps like morphing to different faces really briefly. Yeah. It, um, so I, I think – I like that they're doing that because – oh, I'm trying to be really careful because of <laughs> book stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which uh, – can I tell you? I'm not going to reveal it here. But yeah. When- when that was revealed in the book, never saw it coming. Yeah. Never saw it coming. <laughs> and, and I have been wondering how they were going to do that thing the entire time the show's been on the air. And I feel like, oh, I'm trying to be really careful. If, if I go over a line, please, like, edit it out. Uh, <laughs> I'll I just feel like spoiler warnings. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this introduction of multiple incarnations of the character lays a lot of groundwork for 
that thing. Right. To right. help explain it to an audience who might question it when it happens. And maybe that's where they're laying the groundwork because they know at some point they're going to have to do that. Um, so I, yeah, yes, I'll just say, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's really cool. Um, oh, and I Chris- think, oh, they, they both, they both look so good and all three of them look so good in the trailers. So good. I mean, you know, we already know what Crispin Glover looks like as Mr. World. So, you know, very put together, very menacing and scary. I love when they allow him to really chew his scenery. Because in season one, we essentially had him more so saying, uh, I don't want a war. You do. I'm just sitting here trying. He was really like reactionary in season one. Very reactionary. And in season two, he was terrifying again especially when he was threatening technical boy but so we know what he looks like seeing danny trejo in a suit is just really cool because i think we're all so used to seeing danny trejo as machete and stuff yeah. like that. so seeing him kind of uh wall streeted up is cool and dominic jackson just like she has this air of uh you know, posture and just strength that it looks so badass. So I think we're going to have it where like, yes, they're all incarnations of worlds, but because obviously they're played by different actors, they're all going to have their little special moments that are going to make their interpretation so unique. And I, I'm so pumped with it. Um, and it's going to be, so it's interesting two things with the new gods. And I want to say before, I agree with you. I'm much more of a fan of the new gods. Yeah. When, whenever they had their campaign last season, they were saying hashtag new gods, hashtag old gods. I was constantly saying hashtag new gods. <laughs> I'm on a phone. I'm already worshiping technical boy. <laughs> you know, that's... We're literally on social media right now. We're literally on social media. So, <laughs> um, I was going to say that we get the new incarnations of worlds. I wonder what they're going to do with media because Kaiyun Kim is not coming back as new media. They have not announced uh, hiring anyone to fill that role. I have a feeling that they're literally just going to kind of ignore that character. And I guess that's my worry, too. On the one hand, I don't remember Media playing much of a role in the rest of the book. She's, like, a really minor character in the book. I think there's, like, two or three scenes with her, and she's mostly, like, trying to get Shadow to join them, if my memory serves. And they've done most of those scenes already. There's, like, one in Lakeside, but I don't know that you need it at this point in the story. I don't since, think... since Shadow kind of already knows where his place is to a degree. And again, I'm so excited for Shadow knowing just because... Oh, I think that was a great idea they did. I think it was a great idea. And also, from what we see in the trailers, it seems as if Shadow is more of... He knows himself now, right? In the mm-hmm. first two seasons, we kind of just saw him running around going, I don't know what's going on, and really just out of the loop and naive the whole time. And so now that he knows, like, he knows the truth. He knows who Wednesday is. He knows why Laura Moon is dead. Like, he knows things. And to me, I always like when people know things. Um, I don't know if you ever watched I Zombie. Do you know what I, I'm talking about? I did not. Okay. I actually really loved it too. Um, I think maybe you'd like it, but let's just say there's a character that doesn't know the truth until the very end of season two, where as everyone else in the show knows that truth and you're sitting there the whole time going, Oh, I just wish this one character knew what everyone else knew. And then when they finally do at the end of season two, you're like, Oh, finally, now we don't have to worry about like lies or sneaking around or making excuses i i dislike that so i thought it was really awesome that shadow knows but um i wanted to circle back around to technical boy so it seems in the trailers again i'm going to continue saying this in the trailers um that bruce langley is back as technical boy so what happened to quantum boy (laughs) Because that was a thing at the end of season two. <laughs> yeah. That was 
a thought I had as well, but it was also something I wasn't surprised to see happen because Mm -hmm. with the executive changeover again, they dropped a bunch of plot lines from season one to season two. And as I was doing my rewatch of season two and I hit the finale, I went, hmm, I wonder how much of this they're going to drop. Because they had like, there was that whole like attack on the financial system in the season two finale. Oh, God, and that's right. <laughs> none of the trailers have mentioned anything about that. And I went, hmm, I bet they'll just reboot Tech Boy again. <laughs> Which I'm fine with. I yeah, think it's fine. We've said how much we liked Technical Boy. Um, and Quantum Boy seemed cool, but it seemed it also ripped him of the personality that we liked Technical Boy for. Yeah. Um, so I, I was totally cool with it. It, you know, of course, when you get a new showrunner, one who seems like he just wants to retcon a bunch of things. Um, I think that that's what we're going to see a lot of things from season two dropped. Um, yeah, definitely. So you did your rewatch of season two. What would you say is your favorite episode out of season two? Since we know what season one's is. Um, so for me, it, it kind of switches between, uh, Donar the Great and uh, oh, what was Matt Sweeney's episode called? Was that Treasure of the Sun? Yes. Yeah, it's it's between those two. It, the Donar the Great is great for me because mostly because of the director, uh, Rachel Talele, I think is how you pronounce that. We're gonna go with it. We're gonna uh, go. She, <laughs> she did a bunch of work on Doctor Who back in uh, the Twelfth Doctor's time, and. I don't usually, like, know who's directing American Gods because it's usually directors I haven't heard of who've only done television shows that I haven't seen. Mm -hmm. But her name got announced, and I went, oh, she's doing an episode? And and it was that one, and it was kind of like a musical episode, and it was the Thor story, which was something that was only hinted at in the book, and they just did a whole thing with it. And it was, like, classic Hollywood, and it was all the things I love. (laughs) I love Donar the Great as well. I think that that's certainly a standout in season two for all the reasons that you just explained. I mean, the 1930s is such a cool aesthetic. And we Um, got Telephone Boy. I was going to say we had Telephone Boy. I loved it. Um, I thought that was so great. Uh, And seeing Donar, which, oh, my God. The performances between him and Mr. Nancy, just, uh, you know, I know, unfortunately, Donar went out the way he did, but part of me was hoping they'd find a way to bring him back, because I thought he was great. That whole, just everything about that worked, and it even had, like, a cat. Have you seen the, the musical Cabaret? I have not. So that musical is sort of, it's in the Germany in the 1930s, and it's set in a cabaret club. But all around, you're seeing the rise of Nazism. And so the way that that episode kind of had the the American Nazis creeping in up until the ending felt very cabaret to me. And I really dug that as well. I thought that that introduction was so interesting with, say, Wednesday being confused why those Nazis were wearing the symbol that um and i also liked that telephone boy was trying to get columbia to be essentially their rosie the riveter to for the upcoming war i mean it really was a turning point it seems in the old gods and the new gods like the transformation i think that episode is a lot more important than maybe people realize because then we also have we see gungnir yeah. uh which, by the way, is, like, one of my favorite scenes in the entire season, too. Like, I just love that. Like, anything with rock and roll, I love. So That the fa- whole plot line was so fun. So fun. And isn't that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but isn't the bishop scheme that they pulled off, wasn't that mentioned in the book? Yeah, I think right at the beginning of the Lakeside arc, Wednesday's telling Shadow about his favorite uh, heist. And I think it's that heist, but I could be wrong because it's been a couple years since I read the book. But I've been trying to re-listen to the Lakeside portion in the audiobook just to kind of prepare. But I keep falling asleep because I listen to it at night. <laughs> so that may I, not be 
the best thing. <laughs> I keep, I never make it past the first chapter. I just go to sleep instead. <laughs> but I think, I think it's that highest. If it's not in that scene, I think it's one of the ones that Wednesday describes to Shadow. So I think you're right. I, I want to say I'm right, but I also don't want to say that I'm right in case I'm wrong. <laughs> but I just feel when it was happening, I was sitting there going, oh, my God, they, they're pulling off the bishop heist. Uh, so I thought that that was really fun. To me, it's like kind of now I wanted to see just heist stuff between Shadow and Wednesday. Apparently they do it really well. Um, that's the great thing about Shadow. He is a bit of a con man himself. He just, you know, he's sweet about it. But um yeah, I, I just, that was such a great episode, and I'm hoping that we have plenty of more great episodes in season three, and I wanted to ask, correct me if I'm wrong, because I didn't think too much of it when it was announced, but they gender-bent Heiselman for the show, correct? Yeah, so Hinselman is a guy in the book. He's like an old man, right? and Julia Sweeney is playing the character on the show she was on snl a while i think i've seen the actress in anything i could be wrong i don't Um, think i have either i just read reports that she was on snl at some point yeah and i don't really watch snl i kind of don't think it's funny (laughs) that's just me (laughs) um but uh what you might call it you know i i like that sweet old lady uh okay so it's so funny they announced that eric Johnson and I wanted to bring this up only because they announced that Eric Johnson is playing uh Chad Mulligan in the show, which is hilarious because you get this guy who's like, you know, really good looking. I don't think people are gonna argue that. And then in the book, he's described as a guy, a lanky guy with a pot belly and all that. And then you're like, nah, we're just gonna get this like really good looking guy to be in the show. But um, I was re-watching Supernatural the other day, and I don't know if you've ever watched Supernatural or not. Is he in that? He was in an episode in the fifth season. He played a demon. And I always remember liking that episode, too, because it has Crowley in it. And I just thought it was like a pretty interesting episode. And he plays a demon in it, which is just so funny because he seems such the opposite in American Gods season three. Yeah, I'm sure I saw that episode because I watched up through season five. Um, it's but the... Lord knows if I could tell you anything about what I saw. <laughs> well, if you ever want to look back, it's called The Devil You Know. Um, yeah, I stopped watching Supernatural around season 10. See, that's the thing is that I think there needs to be a sweet spot with uh, shows. Like for me, if American Gods, right, if they announce, say, all right, it's going to be a fourth and final season. I don't think I'd be too heartbroken. I love no. the show. I, I think see I think four seasons is about right. I worry if you go to a fifth season, you stretch it too thin. Exactly. Especially now that they're getting to Lakeside. I feel and by the way, this is gonna be ten episodes as opposed to the previous two seasons that are were eight episodes. So you're already in Lakeside. You've already done a lot of stuff in the previous two seasons. I think that season four would be good to wrap everything up. As you said, I would be fearful that season five would stretch things. Um, The fact that super, and I'm going to say this and the supernatural fans are going to come for me, but you go 15 seasons. That's a lot of filler. I mean, they had like 20 episodes each season. Maybe only four of them had real plot points to it. Oh yeah. the, The supernatural fans can come for me. That show should have ended at season five. And I stand by that to this day. Be, well, I think that it was supposed to, because if you watch the finale of season five, it yeah. felt like a series finale, and then it just kept going. Yep. Um, <laughs> I liked up until season nine, just because I liked a few of the characters that were in it. Season 10, when they like really dropped the ball on this one storyline with dean i was like you guys don't know what you're doing anymore <laughs> is that when is that when he got the the mark of cain was that that time he, he became a demon like they they ah. in it was in season nine he got the mark of cain and they teased that he was going to become a demon the whole time And at the very end of the season they were like dean's a demon and never and they you know promoted it they teased it people are like oh my god yeah and 
he was a demon for like two episodes. He did it really well, by the way. That would have been so interesting to see a whole season out of it. And then in the third episode, he they figured out a way to make him normal again. And I was like, oh, come on. Ooh. Really? Really? Couldn't this have would... given that half a season. You couldn't have given it a half a season. So I think as soon as that happened, I said to myself, Supernatural doesn't know what it's doing anymore. So <laughs> for me, you know, four seasons for American Gods would be really great. I'd be fine with that. Um, and as long as it can finish up its story. Because the worst thing to me is if it got canceled without telling its whole story. I am just so nervous it's going to get canceled this season, which <sighs> would be perhaps the most infuriating season to be canceled on. Yes, 100%. And that's the thing. It's funny because it's like we're both fans, right? And yeah. We- we tweet about it we respond to tweets and everything and so i don't want say necessarily this podcast to come off as negative i just think that we're worried and i feel like so many shows that i have loved throughout the years i get worried when uh you know a season comes out i'm like come on please don't cancel it please don't cancel it (laughs) i mean i lived my enjoyment of hannibal in a state of constant worry because every (laughs) single season that show was inches away from being canceled nobody watched it on nbc it was like dark and and not the kind of thing that airs on that network and so i think there's i think there's a balancing act when you have something you love but it's something that not a lot of people love so you end up living in this this world where it's like what can they do to reach out to people but what can they do to reach out to people without ruining what they've got do they even need to you know well i'll say this on air I think that American Gods needs to up its marketing. Uh, oh, for that's, sure. that's something that I look at their because I thought their marketing for season two was really cool. Um, and I see for season three and it just looks like such a half ass attempt at marketing. I think even to the point where I think I even reached out to them at some point because I do marketing for clients and I was like, you need help. <laughs> I didn't ever hear back, but um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I feel you with that. I, that's how I felt with iZombie because I loved it. And I know people who were huge fans of iZombie, but not everyone even knew what the show was. And so every season, because um, it was on the CW and yeah. uh, shows like Supernatural, The Flash, Arrow, got such early renewals um they were always getting renewal and then i zombie it's like the season would already end and you were waiting weeks and weeks to hear them finally go and i zombie renewed for another season you're like oh thank god you know thank thanks god. for keeping me in limbo there um but it's funny with hannibal right i thought it was quite good i only watched the first season i thought it was really good um i'm sure you're excited oh you hear- missed out the second season is the best season Really? All right. The it's second not season finale second... <laughs> is genuinely one of the best season finales I have ever seen. Like, it is, I think, the peak of Brian Fuller's career as as a showrunner is the season two finale, where all of these different storylines just come crashing together, and there is literally a ticking clock happening with the music where like it's building up to this thing they've been teasing since the beginning of the season. And for the first half, Brian Wrightsell, who did the score for the first season of American gods, he is using like almost a metronome and it's just ticking away as it builds to what you know is about to happen. And then it happens and then you get the fallout and it is such an immensely satisfying hour of television that I cannot put it into words. I it's on Netflix, so I definitely have to check it out. I wouldn't have thought I have so many thoughts with Hannibal and I know this isn't a Hannibal podcast, so I'll <laughs> say it really quick that um I would have never first of all known that that was a Brian Fuller uh show. Yeah. Um just because like you could tell like between American Gods season 1 and Pushing Daisies I think the show is called, which yeah. I also never saw, but I just saw clips of it. But that seems very much like a Brian Fuller show. And then you have Hannibal, which is 
just to me didn't feel like a Brian Fuller show, but I thought Mads Mikkelsen did an amazing job to the point where I would sit there and say, I kind of liked him better as Hannibal than Sir Anthony Hopkins. And again, no disrespect to Sir Anthony Hopkins. I mean, of course he made the character what it is. Um, but Mads Mikkelsen just did such a delightful uh, rendition of Hannibal. But I was going to say that there are like rumors that they may Netflix may bring it back for a fourth season. I hope they don't. And that's all I will say. (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) I I thought the third season was a bit of a mixed bag. Mm. And, but I thought the ending was the closest thing to a perfect ending for that show you could get. And I don't want to see anymore. There was a beautiful ambiguity to it that I don't, if you do anything more, you ruin the ambiguity. You know, I respect that Um, because I feel like we're now in an age, and I say this a lot, we're in an age of reboots and revivals and all that. So it's actually interesting hearing someone say that they wouldn't want that to happen. Um, But I definitely have to check out the second season of Hannibal. But Michael, I know I've kept you on now for like an hour here, but... (laughs) I do have to ask before we kind of go into our wrapping up phase, what are you say most excited for in season three? What am I most excited for? (laughs) Yeah. Um, I just really want to see the lakeside stuff. Like, honestly, it's, I love creepy towns. It's my favorite part of the book. I am excited for the lakeside stuff. I didn't think I would be so excited because I'll admit that when I first heard the book, I really didn't get, I didn't get into the lakeside portion as much as maybe other people did. Um, I liked it, but I guess in a book form, I wasn't as excited, but from what we've seen in the trailers, the uh, interviews with the cast members, it's really getting me excited. And I feel like it's kind of a nice break from the road tripping that, the first two seasons have been all about so it'll be nice to see shadow uh stationary him knowing now about wednesday i think that i'm just really excited to see what the new gods are up to because i think we both have really surmised that they are totally retconning what the new gods were up to in the season two finale so what they're up to in season three um and just what's happening like first of all what's happening with laura and liam because um you know in a in the trailer laura's saying that she's gonna go kill mr wednesday and all that and then she has liam with her i mean and my whole thing is i don't know if you caught this in the trailer but laura has gungnir yeah that looks exactly like gungnir like, that has to be Gungnir, but to me, uh, didn't Sweeney put that in the Horde before he died? So how does Laura have access to the Horde? I have a that, theory, but I can't share the theory. <laughs> when, once we stop recording, I want to hear your theory. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, um... It, unless you have anything else you want to say, I think that we kind of did our our due diligence with American Gods. I'm freaking pumped for this. <laughs> uh, I cannot wait for it to come back. <laughs> we better get swag. I'm just saying. I think we're holding up the American Gods fandom. I say that confidently. Look, I've got swag. So they should I just don't. Send you swag. <laughs> oh man, there was um what you calls it uh i don't know who the twitter user was uh, first of all congratulations to her but she won the clunker uh thing that stuff looked so cool it looked so cool when she posted i was like i thought i was close too to the time <laughs> but it, i can't be jealous i won the new york comic con one so i got a poster a t-shirt and i got to talk to uh ricky whittle uh <gasps> oh. bruce langley and yatide badaki and I... they're the sweetest people it was only 30 seconds, and you could tell they were so, like, rushed because they, they really wanted to talk to everyone, but there was such a limited time. So it was literally like a, like a hi, what's your question? And then very quickly answer the question and then leave. But they were the sweetest people that I've ever talked to that I didn't, like, actually know. 
I wanted so last year uh, for New York Comic Con, right? I uh, what you call? I got press badges, obviously working for Geek Vibes and all that. And there was a thing where we were trying to get uh, into the press panel for American Gods season two, and I think we had requested it too late, and uh. so obviously didn't get in. So I didn't go to the Friday uh, New York Comic Con, you know, but I just saw, or did I? Oh, God, when did I go? No, I went on a Saturday, but they still had, like, the American Gods Diner set up. So I was able to go into that and look at it and just kind of be jealous of all the people who were able to see the cast. And now I'm jealous of you for seeing the cast. And I remember um, when I thought about it, I was like, well, they got renewed for a third season, so they'll probably be at New York Comic Con again. So we're going to try again in 2020. And then 2020 everything happened. happened. <laughs> And so, you know, that didn't happen. But, you know, that's really cool. They seem, like, really sweet. And if I could tell you, it seems like the show knows that Ricky, Yatiti, and Bruce are, like, their star children. Mm -hmm. Because they're always doing the press together. That's the other thing I'm most excited about from those trailers, is it seems like the three of them have a lot more to do together. Yes, I mean, what was it? Ricky Whittle said on one of his tweets, going, "Oh, me and Technical Boy team up." It's like, what? What did? What did they? Like, team what up? do you mean they team up? They hate each other. What is <laughs> happening? I love it. What is happening? And then to see more Bill Quist and Tech Boy um, interactions with each other, because that's another thing. Again, I'm not trying to spoil anything, but that certain thing that happens in the book. I'm like, I really hope that doesn't happen in the show. <laughs> Cause I hope it doesn't happen in the show. I, I so hope it doesn't happen. Like, Yatiti is a freaking godsend. All pun intended. Such a godsend. I want her to play Storm in the Marvel Universe. I would so be so down with that. It would be so sick. I love it. Um, But in the end, Michael and I don't know what's going to happen in season three. Um, no, we don't. <laughs> it comes out, uh, shit, January 10th. Yep. So we are not that far along from it. I urge people who are listening to watch it. It's a great show. I know that we talked about some of the drama behind the scenes, but I feel like every show kind of has drama behind the scenes. Um, I think with just social media, maybe we're just more aware of it, but I'm really interested to see season three. I hope everyone else is as well. Michael, before I let you go, please plug yourself, let everyone know where they can find you, what you do, and all that good stuff. Cool. Um, so I run Thoroughly Modern Reviewer, which um, is just a site where I review the things that I consume. And my Twitter handle is at Thoroughly Me, or as Kevin Smith once called me during a New York Comic Con panel, Thorough Lime. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. <laughs> it was the yeah. Sandman panel, and it was just, <laughs> I went, my question got answered, but he got my name wrong. It's like, come on, Kevin Smith, come on. <laughs> but that is where I can be found. I am there all the time, and I'm loud about the things I like. We love that. Here at Geek Fives Nation, we love loud fans. And I'm glad that we got to connect. And um, you can definitely see my coverage of American Gods at Geek Fives Nation. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at TFAB. Please make sure you check that out. Um, it's been great speaking with you today, Michael. And I will see everyone next time. See you guys. while ago i believe hey greenville as we enter the new year it's the perfect time to start planning for your healthy pest-free lawn with true green america's number one lawn care company true green science-based approach and local expertise will give your lawn the year-round care it needs to be thick and weed free go to truegreen.com radio to take advantage of our special new year's offer and save 50 percent just call 1-866-967-7016 or go to truegreen.com radio today to take advantage of this limited time offer for a greener healthier lawn that you can be proud of.